Descartes' ideas on the pineal gland as found in the passions of the soul, which he wrote um, uh, at the end of his life. Okay, the most extensive account of Descartes' pineal neurophysiology and pineal neuropsychology is to be found in his The Passions of the Soul, 1649, the last book that he published. The Passions may be seen as a continuation of the Treaties of Men, except that the direction of approach is different. The Treaties of Man starts with the body and announces that the soul will be traded later. The conclusion would probably have been that we are indistinguishable from the hypothetical men who resemble us, uh, with which the treaties of man is concerned, and that we are just such machines equipped with a rational soul ourselves. So that's, the author here thinks that's where that is going, but um, it's it never gets there. In the passions, now, Descartes starts from the other end with man and begins by splitting man up into body and soul. Descartes' criterion for determining whether a function belongs to the body or the soul was as follows. Anything we experience as being in us and which we see can also exist in wholly inanimate bodies uh, must be attributed only to our body. On the other hand, anything in, a, in us which we cannot conceive in any way as capable of belonging to a body must be attributed to our soul. So anything that we can conceive of as being in a physical, three-dimensional substance must be attributed to the body, and anything that cannot has to be in the soul. Thus, because we have no conception of the body as thinking in any way at all, we have reason to believe that every kind of thought present in us belongs to the soul. And since we do not doubt that there are inanimate bodies which can move in as many different ways as our bodies, if not more, and which have as much heat or more, we must believe that all the heat and all the movements present in us, insofar as they do not depend on thought, belong solely to the body. Okay. Um, just before he mentioned the pineal gland uh, for the first time, Descartes, it, Descartes emphasized that the soul is joined to the whole body. Quote, we need to recognize that the soul is really joined to the whole body and that we cannot properly say that it exists in any one part of the body to the exclusion of the others. For the body is a unity which is in a sense indivisible because of the arrangement of its organs. These being so related to one another that the removal of any one of them renders the whole body defective. And the soul is of such a nature that it has no relation to extension. That's geometric extension, like length, width, and, and breadth. Um, <clears throat> so the nature of the soul, uh, the soul is of such a nature that it has no relation to extension or to the dimensions of other properties of the matter of which the body is composed. It is related solely to the whole assemblage of the body's organs. This is obvious from our inability to conceive of a half or a third of a soul, or of the extension which a soul occupies, the space that a soul occupies. Nor does the soul become any smaller if we cut off some part of the body but it becomes completely separated from the body when we break up the assemblage of the body's organs. But even though the soul is joined to the whole body, quote, nevertheless, there is a certain part of the body where it exercises its functions more particularly than in all the others. The part of the body in which the soul directly exercises its functions is not the heart at all or the whole of the brain. It is rather the innermost part of the brain which is a certain very small gland situated in the middle of the brain substance and suspended above the passage through which the spirits in the brain's anterior cavities communicate with those in its posterior cavities. The slightest movements on the part of this gland may alter very greatly the course of these spirits and conversely any change, however slight, taking place in the course of the spirits may do much to change the movements of the glands in the other direction, okay, of the gland. 
Okay, the view that the soul is attached to the whole body is already found in St. Augustine's work. Uh, Augustine says, in each body, the whole soul is in the whole body and the whole in each part of it. Okay, so St. Thomas Aquinas accepted this view and explained it by saying that the soul is completely present in each part of the body, just as whiteness is, in a certain sense, completely present in each part of the surface of a blank sheet of paper. In deference to Aristotle, he added that this does not exclude that some organs, the heart for example, are more important with respect to some of the faculties of the soul than others. Okay. Augustine's and Aquinas' thesis, uh, thesis sounds reasonable as long as the soul is regarded as the principle of life. Along these Aristotelian ways. The principle of life may well held, uh, may well held to be, the principle of life may well held to be completely present in each living part of the body, just as biologists now say that the complete genome is present in each living cell. However, Descartes did not regard the soul as the principle of life. He regarded it as the principle of thought. This makes one wonder what he may have meant by his, his remark. What would a principle of thought be doing in the bones and toes? One might think that Descartes meant that although the pineal gland is the only organ to which the soul is immediately joined, the soul is nevertheless indirectly joined to the rest of the body by means of the threads and the spirits and the nerves. But Descartes did not view this as immediate uh, attachment. Quote, I do not think that the soul is so imprisoned in the gland that it cannot act elsewhere. But utilizing the thing is not the same as being immediately joined or united to it. Moreover, it is clear that not all parts of the body are innervated. So the solution of this puzzle is to be found in a passage which Descartes wrote a few years before the passions, in which he compared the mind with the heaviness or gravity of a body. Quote, I saw that the gravity, while remaining coextensive with the heavy body, could exercise all its force in any one part of the body. For if the body were hung from a rope attached to any part of it, it would still pull the rope down with all of its force, just as if all the gravity existed in the part actually touching the rope instead of being scattered through the remaining parts. This is exactly the way in which I now understand the mind to be coextensive with the body. The whole mind in the whole body and the whole mind in any one of its parts. He added that he thought that our ideas about gravity are derived from our conception of the soul. Okay, so Descartes is noticing that there is an issue with gravity, which uh, which Isaac Newton is yet to explain in terms of force. Um, in the second liter secondary literature, one often meets with the claim that Descartes maintained that the soul has no spatial extension. But this claim is, a claim is obviously wrong in view of Descartes' own assertions. Those who make it may have been misled by Descartes' quite different claim that extension is not the principle attribute of the soul, where principle has a conceptual or epistemic sense. Okay, well, we'll set that aside. Sometimes the Stanford Encyclopedia gets a little too deep for us, uh, but I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, draw out the important points here in a later video. Most of the themes discussed in the Treaties of Man and in the correspondence of 1640 as quoted above, reappear in the passions of the soul. As this summary indicates, quote, the small gland, which is the principal seat of the soul, is suspended within the cavities containing these spirits, so that it can be moved by them in as many different ways as there are perceptual, perceptible differences in objects. But it can also be moved in various different ways by the soul, whose nature is such that it receives as many different impressions, that is, it has as many different perceptions as there occur different movements in the gland. And conversely, the mechanism of our body is so constructed that simply by this glands being moved in any way by the soul or by any other cause, it drives the surrounding spirit 
spirits towards the pores of the brain, which direct them through the nerves to the muscles. And in this way, the gland makes the spirits move the limbs. Okay. The description of recollection is more vivid than in the treatise of man. Quote, thus, when the soul wants to remember something, this volition makes the gland lean first to one side and then to another, thus driving the spirits towards different regions of the brain until they come upon the one containing traces left by the object we want to remember. These traces consist simply in the fact that the pores of the brain through which the spirits previously made their way owing to the presence of this object have therefore thereby become more apt than the others to be opened in the same way when the spirits again flow towards them. And so the spirits enter into these pores more easily when they come upon them, thereby producing in the gland that special movement re which represents the same object to the soul and makes it recognize the object as the one it wanted to remember. The description of the effect of the soul on the body in the causation of bodily movements is also more detailed. Quote, the activity of the soul consists entirely in the fact that simply by willing something, it brings it about that the little gland to which it is closely joined moves in the manner required to produce the effect corresponding to this volition. Okay. Um, the pineal neurophysiology of the passions or emotions is similar to what is occurring in perception. Quote, the ultimate and most proximate cause of the passions of the soul is simply the agitation by which the spirits move the little gland in the middle of the brain. However, there are some new ingredients which have no parallel in the treaties of man. For example, in a chapter on the conflicts that are usually supposed to occur between the lower part and the higher part of the soul. We read, quote, the little gland in the middle of the brain can be pushed to one side by the soul and to the other side by the animal spirits, and that conflicting volitions may result in a conflict between, quote, the force with which the spirits push the gland so as to cause the soul to desire something and the force with which the soul, by its volition to avoid this thing, pushes the gland in a contrary direction. In later times, it was often objected that incorporeal volitions cannot move the corporeal pineal gland because this would violate the law of the conservation of energy. This is uh, Isaac Newton. We haven't gotten there yet. Descartes did not have this problem because he did not know this law. Uh, we may nevertheless have foreseen difficulties because when he states his third law of motion, he left the possibility open that it does not apply in this case. Quote, all the particular causes of the changes which bodies undergo are covered by this third law, or at least the law covers all changes which are themselves corporal. I am not here inquiring into the existence or nature, nature of any power to move bodies which may be possessed by human minds or the minds of angels. Okay, so, um, so there are some interesting questions here, uh, but I, I'll leave the summary until later. So let's cut this off here.